Hello. It's your favorite. I'm declaring that for myself. Um, Nick Stone here to talk to you about the power of dialogue. Um, this masterclass is he, she, they said what now? And I will be focusing today on not only what dialogue is, but why we need it in our stories and how you do it. So the first question I want to answer here that nobody has asked, but it's my masterclass. I get to do this the way I want to, right? Um, what exactly is dialogue? In order to answer this very obvious question, I want to talk about something that I usually tell people when they ask me for tips for being a I always get is what are some tips for me as a young writer? My third tip that I always give, so I say read, I say write, and then I say eavesdrop. Now, when I tell people to eavesdrop, basically what I'm telling them to do is listen to other people's conversations. Um, of course, you don't want to get caught, but when I was able to write in a coffee shop, it's not a thing I've been able to do in a while now, but when I was able to do it, there were times when I would sit with my headphones on, typing or looking like I'm typing, but instead of actually typing, I would be listening to the conversation going on next to me. Part of the reason I do that is because listening to people talk gives you a lot of insight into how human beings function, into like what we're thinking, how we're feeling, and also how does a person look when they're excited? How does their voice sound when they're angry, et cetera? Now, why would I do this? This is where the question of what dialogue is and why it's important comes into play. Um, so obviously dialogue are those chunks of text on the page where there are people talking. There are a myriad of ways to do dialogue, to write di dialogue in the book, and we'll get to that in you know a few minutes. But the dialogue is the part of the story, like I said, where people are talking to each other. So why is dialogue necessary? So, okay, my child, I have two of them, my younger one, he's four years old. There's this book he loves called The Little Blue Truck. The, uh, the kind of like through line here is the little blue truck went down the road, beep, said blue to the little green toad. So it's a story about this little truck, uh, lives on a farm. Every day he drives across the farm in the morning, he drives across the farm to get wherever he's going. And as he's driving across, he says hello, beeps hello to all of the animals that he encounters, right? So he'll beep at the toad, he beeps at the chickens, he beeps at the cow. All of these animals are there and you know they like moo or croak or whatever. comes onto the farm. And when this big dump truck comes onto the farm, he doesn't really say hello to anybody. He's like, not the nicest dump truck. I mean, if a dump truck could be nice, but like this dump truck just goes through all self-important, doesn't beep at anybody, acknowledges no one, acknowledges no animals. Well, then that dump truck gets stuck in the mud. And this is where things get interesting for me in this story, because what ends up happening is the little blue truck rallies all of his friends that he says hello to every morning, and they go and they help this dump truck get out of the mud. So where you have this story about trucks and about animals, really it's a story about humanity. It's a story about people, about what it means to be kind, about what happens when you're not kind and you wind up in a rut. This is why dialogue is important. Dialogue is important because all stories are about people, right? Stories in a very general sense are a very human invention, I guess is one way to put it. Um, we tell stories to teach a lesson, we tell stories to entertain, and we tell stories to stay connected to one another. And that I think is the most important thing about storytelling. There is no story that's ever been told that wasn't in some way, shape or form about connection and about a character moving from one starting point, going through a bunch of stuff and winding up at a different ending point. In order to do that though, most of the time that character is going to have to interact with other characters in the book. Um, I think about The Hunger Games a lot because The Hunger Games is one of those books where you have this character who is on their own for the majority of the book. Um, in, and I'm talking about like the original, like the first book in the Hunger Games series. For a lot of that book, Katniss is wandering around in this forest, trying to stay alive and not really interacting with anyone. So we see a lot of her internal, her internal dialogue, I guess is a way to put it. Um, we see a lot of her thoughts. We see a lot, of, there's a lot of action, but there's also a lot going on inside of her. 
There's also a lot going on inside of her. I keep freezing. Okay, am I back? I don't know what happened. Um, as I was saying, in the Hunger Games, a lot of Katniss's time is spent alone. So when we see her internal thinking, there isn't dialogue with other characters, but there's still a lot going on. She's still learning a lot about herself. She's learning a lot about the world around her. So in that case, obviously, the dialogue is all internal. But my point here is that even with this character who's not really interacting with many people for the majority of the story, there's still an arc. There's still a need for communication. There's still this this sense that this character is going from one point to another internally and that that will involve other people at some point even if for most of the book she's by herself so with dialogue because stories are about people people communicate with each other like that's the whole point in in like talking is communication so we use english we learn the english language as kids we start learning how to read and to write and to spell and the purpose of literacy is being able to position yourself in the world in relationship to other people through communication so with that in mind, right, dialogue in stories, I think, serves one of three purposes. It's either going to progress your plot in some way, um, it is going to deliver information, or it is going to develop a character. And all three of those things can happen simultaneously. Sometimes you read a story that has really great dialogue, and in the dialogue, you're learning about different people. One example of this, and I'm totally gonna use my own books because that's the dialogue I know best. Um, in Dear Martin, for instance, there's a section of this book, actually there are a few sections of this book that are written in what I call pure dialogue. And in these sections, we learn a lot about the characters who are speaking. Um, I will talk about how I wrote these particular sections when I get to the next part, but for now, I'm just gonna read a few lines. Doc, yes, Mr. Christensen? Doc, okay, let's hear it. Jared, I'd like to discuss how affirmative action discriminates against members of the majority. Justice, eyebrows rise. SJ, you're not even serious. Jared, oh, I certainly am. Let's observe, shall we? I'm ranked number two in our class. I'm captain of the baseball team. I do community service on weekends and I got a higher test scores than Justice. Yet he got into Yale early action and I didn't. I know for a fact it's because I'm black. I'm white and he's black. Doc, that's quite an assumption, Mr. Christensen. Justice, hold up. What makes you so sure you got higher scores than me? Jared, dude, I got a 1580 on the SAT. Manny, what'd you get, Just? Just, 1560. Jared, C? SJ, what about the ACT? Jared, 33. SJ, Justice? Justice, 34. Jared, bullshit. So in this scene, which is one of my favorite scenes in Dear Martin, um, largely because I literally pulled it from my life. My senior year of high school, I had almost this exact scene go down in my AP language and composition class. There was a girl in my class who just could not fathom the idea that I had gotten a higher ACT score than she did. And, you know, obviously I felt a way about it. I still feel a way about it. But what we are learning in this scene is that this character, Jared, is not a very nice guy. And it's not like we didn't know that before, but what we can see from the way that Jared is speaking and the things that he's saying is that he has some things that he needs to address with regard to implicit bias and racism. Um, another thing that dialogue can do here, I'm gonna read a little bit from Shuri. Uh, so in this scene, dialogue is used a little bit differently. Okay. Um, finally, you're back. A girl, sure he thinks, voice says, I was beginning to wonder if I needed to convene a search party. Quick as a flash, Shuri rips the, the slightest bit. A blast of purple light and electromagnetic energy, shoot, though the intruder won't know that until it hits them, shoots out of the bead at the center of her Kamoyo bracelet and she drops and rolls forward so that she's hidden behind her giant bed. What the, ow, the voice says uncalled for, it makes the princess smile. 
But then there's movement above her, a bounce on the bed. And the next thing Shuri knows, a pair of arms are wrapping around her from behind, one at the neck and one around the chest, pinning her arms. Shuri thrashes. Well, she tries to at least. The person is very strong and Shuri's too out of practice for her twists and turns to do much of anything. Though she has to admit, the invader seems shorter than she would have expected. A little rusty, eh? The voice purrs in her ear. Let me go, Shuri barks. As you wish. The arms released her and flash her faster than she can blink. The person has slipped in front of Shuri, grabbed her pulse shooting arm and flipped her onto flipped her onto her back on the bed. The girl's face appears above the princess, round, deep brown and set with dark eyes that now sparkle with mischief. By best, you are dramatic, she says, shooting at me. Really? Oh, Shuri says, the fight going out of her. It's you. She sits up. So in this scene, we have Princess Shuri of Wakanda coming into her bedroom and discovering that there's somebody in there. Um, and there's a quick fight scene, obviously, the sort of fight scene, really sure he's just getting her butt kicked. And we discover through the dialogue that these two girls know each other. So in the second case, the dialogue is used a little bit for character development, but more for establishing the plot, like progressing the plot, right? So these girls are talking and through their conversation, we learn that this other person no Shuri, and that she's been waiting there for her. Um, and like I said, the third way that dialogue functions is for plot progression. Let me grab this other book. And in this scene that I'm going to read, this is one of my one of my very, very most favorites. So I'm going to start here. See, that's you guys' problem right there, I say. Neither of you have any appreciation for the inherent value of women as human beings. Coop, do you hear yourself right now, Britton says. Gala gets up to add more weight to the bar. See, Goliath. He lies back down for a second set. You've been hanging with Jupiter way too much, homie. You assholes do realize that part of the reason girls like me is because they know I'll treat them with ut utmost respect, right? Doc, we're not saying be disrespectful, but you can't tell me these girls don't offer you the goods. You turn them down. Right, from Britain. And tell and you tell yourself they like that nice guy stuff if you want to. But these honeys ain't ignoring the fact that you're one of the top high school basketball players in the state. Maybe even the nation. And you look like a less swole, beardless version of that dude who guards the Rainbow Bridge in the Thor movies, Golly says, with the brown skin and kind of lightish eyes. Women love that stuff. It's not all about looks, Golly. He's hopeless, dog. This from Britain. This is what happens when a straight dude is raised by two gay men and has a feminist sister figure who doesn't like dudes. Wait, so my valuing of girls is a problem? And leave my sister figure out of it. Hmm, <laughs> from golly. Sister figure my ass. He sits up. Who do you think we don't know you're madly in love with Jupiter Sanchez, bro? Can't say we blame you. Britain comes over and sits next to golly on the weight bench. Your girl is fine as a well-aged well wine. So this is going to be a two-on-one then. That she is, my friend, from golly. She's got that smile, all that curly hair, them bright eyes and luster's lips, and booty for days, brah. Hey, you assholes watch your mouths and your minds. Golly starts cracking up, which is always an interesting experience since he's, since he's six foot seven and 240 pounds of mahogany steel, but has this high-pitched hyena giggle. Just admit it, Coop, Britton says. You got a Jones in your bones for your chick digging stepsister. She's not my stepsister. Golly laughs even harder. The guy's on the verge of tears. Coop, how long have we known each other? Seven years. How many times have we had a conversation about girls that didn't come back around to Jupiter? How the hell would I know, Golly? Girls are pretty much all we talk about. And every time we talk about them, whether it's me getting laid or you getting dumped or Britain getting played, hey, shut your big hyena laughing ass up, brah. Golly giggles again. My point is, no matter how, when, why the conversation starts, it always ends with Coop saying, well, guess it's a good thing I've got Jupe in his G golly willikers voice. So that particular dialogue passage, I really enjoy those three characters, um, is about the delivery of information, right? So where you have one that's, honestly, they all are doing all three, but like, I think the primary thing in each of those passages is different. In the one I read from Dear Martin, the primary thing is character development, character ex like showing who a person is. In the one I read from Shuri, it's about plot progression. And in the third one, it's about information delivery, right? So we're learning a lot. 
we're learning a lot about these characters and what's going on in their lives through the things that they're saying. Which brings me to the next point. So we have our what, we have our why. Now we need to talk about how. How do we actually write dialogue? This is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things to talk about, largely because I think dialogue is one of the spaces where you can be infinitely creative in your writing. So I have seen dialogue written without quotation marks. Your basic dialogue is going to have quotation mark, sentence, punctuation, close quotation mark. The next person speaking obviously will have to start a new paragraph. This is just like your basic grammar. However, when it comes to dialogue, my favorite thing about it is the way that it's structured on the page gives a lot of insight into who is speaking. So a lot of it is kind of self-telling, right? Which brings me to the question of dialogue tags. So I hate them passionately, which is why in a lot of my books, you have what I call pure dialogue. And that's what I read from Dear Martin. So you have a character's name, you have a colon, and then you have what the character is saying. This is one way to do dialogue that I really appreciate because it removes you as the storyteller from the room, right? So because you don't have the dialogue tags with like, he, sh he said, she said, Jared says, SJ says, Justice mumbles, Manny grumbles. Like without those tags, there's a lot more space for the reader to kind of insert themselves into the scene, in my opinion. Like there's no like scientific proof of this. I haven't done any experiments where I've asked people like, are you able to engage more if the dialogue has tags or not? When I am, do, when I am writing dialogue that doesn't have tags, it's always going to be very much on purpose because I want the reader to be able to find themselves in the text without the voice of a narrator dictating where they should position themselves. What do I mean by this? So for instance, in the affirmative action, in the affirmative action conversation in Dear Martin, I could have had justice narrating the conversation. So we're seeing the entire conversation through the lens of justice's thinking. I'm gonna say that again, cause I froze for a second. When it comes to the conversation about affirmative action in Dear Martin, I could have structured that conversation where we're seeing what Justice is thinking as the characters are talking. So basically the, the conversation is coming through Justice's perspective. If I had done it that way, it would have been necessary for me to insert Justice's internal commentary into the text. For instance, if I'm writing a story and a person is in a room with two other people and they're hearing what these other people are saying and the story is being told through them, not only will we hear what everyone is saying, we will also get what the person is thinking about what the other two people are saying. And if you don't get that, then like, it's just not very realistic. So part of the reason I choose to write in pure dialogue when I do is because I want that to be a scene where the reader gets to decide The reader gets to decide, the reader gets to decide what they think and how they feel about what's being said in this space, right? So other times I do want to use a POV character to kind of tell the conversation. In that case, this is the how here when you're having dialogue that comes from a, a specific character. Like, so you have a, a point of view character and all of the dialogue will flow through their point of view. In this case, your dialogue will have two components. There's the outside stuff, which is what's spoken, and then the other person is responding or the other people are responding. But then there's the inside stuff, right? So like how your point of view character is thinking and feeling about what is being said, right? There's a lot of that in the Shuri passage that I read. So these two girls are having a conversation, but in the thick of that conversation, we're finding out how the main character is feeling about what's going on. So where a person might say something aloud, the outside, that's what they say outside, and they say something aloud in response to something said to them, we also need to include on the page what's going on with them inside, because that tells us whether or not they agree with what's being said, that tells us how what's being said is hitting them, it tells us how what's being said is impacting them, which is vital when it comes to developing a character and when it comes to a narrative arc, right? So like if you have a person being affected by something said, that needs to appear on the page if it's coming from that character's perspective. 
I'm so sorry I'm freezing so much. I don't know what's going on. Um, I'm going to say that one more time because it froze midway. If you have a book from a character's perspective, you have to include with your dialogue what's going on internally for that character so that you you fulfill the purpose of using connection to build this character's story. Hopefully that made sense. Um, so like I said, different ways of doing it. You can use the tags when you're doing when you're doing conversations that have like So when I'm writing dialogue, I try to limit the number of people who are speaking. This is because dialogue tags can get to the point where they kind of bog down your text. Um, this is another one of the reasons that I wrote some of the scenes in Dear Martin and Dear Justice in pure dialogue. Like every scene that's in pure dialogue, there are at least four people speaking, if not more. And the reason, like I said, it's to help people insert themselves into the room, but there's also it keeps the conversation from being stilted because of dialogue tags. Because if you think about it, right? Say you have five people having a conversation in a room. In order to hear what everybody's saying, you're gonna have to say who's saying it, right? It's one thing if there's only two people speaking. When there are only two people speaking in a conversation, you don't really need dialogue tags at all. You can use them for rhythm to like put beats into the page. But for the most part, all you need to differentiate between who's talking is a new paragraph. Because like I said before, when you're structuring dialogue, in order to show that a new character is speaking, you have to move to the next, after you've closed your parentheses, you move to the next line and you open a new parentheses with what the next person is saying. So in a two person conversation, you can tag, you cannot tag. However, when you get up to like five people talking, I just think that like, this is just me like expressing my opinion here. I think that the conversations can get unwieldy if you're using a bunch of tags, right? So I will give you my piece of advice here. If you have kind of an ensemble cast or you have, you have a book where you have multiple people speaking, give the pure dialogue thing a try. Give the pure dialogue thing a try where you have name, colon, what's being said, name, colon, what's being said, and just see how you feel about it. Another thing about dialogue tags is that you can use them, like I said before, to establish a rhythm in a text. So sometimes characters are talking. In order for it to sound a certain way in the reader's head, you have to add a beat or a pause, and you can add a beat or a pause using a dialogue tag. So a person is speaking, sometimes it's like a long paragraph of text. You break that up by using the tag. He said, she whispered, et cetera. Um, my favorite thing, like I said before, about dialogue is that there are so many ways that you can wield it. Um, so last thing I will say, and then I will open to questions, is don't be afraid to not get it right on the first try. Um, I have a lot of conversations with younger writers about the power of a first draft and how like, I feel like there are things that we are learning, things we're trying to get better at and you put too much pressure on yourself in the beginning or like at the, at the outset to get it right when you're just starting to develop a skill. So feel free to write your initial drafts of your conversations really as they come out of you. You can always go back in and massage them and make them good. One last pro tip, if you can, if you have the opportunity, read screenplays. Screenplays are an excellent way of learning how dialogue functions, right? Because I do see a lot of times where people are using dialogue, but the dialogue comes across as unrealistic because it's very forced. When you're thinking about how people converse, a person in conversation isn't gonna tell the other person something they already know. So there are a lot of times when dialogue, especially dialogue used to deliver information, gets a little mishandled because you have a person speaking and telling the character something that that character should already know. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of this. Like say you have two characters and, oh, perfect example. You have two characters. One character is telling these two characters, these two characters are best friends. One character is trying to tell another character
So there's something going on with a character's sibling and they're trying to tell their best friend about it. In that case, the character's not gonna say, yeah, I was talking to Johnny, my brother. Like your best friend knows who your brother is, right? So when you're constructing your dialogue, make sure you're aware of the relationship between the two characters so that you know what this character would or wouldn't say to this person that they're speaking to. I will start taking questions now. Let's see what's up in here. Okay. Ooh, I like this. So there's a, there's a question from Ashley. Tips for using pronouns versus names when writing scenes with a lot of characters of the same gender. So in this case, what the, what the first thing I will say is that if you have a lot of characters of the same gender, make sure your character development is solid so that all of the characters have different voices, right? So part of the battle with dialogue is making sure the characters don't all sound alike on the page. I typically lean into using names more often than the pronouns, but there's also like an intuitive thing to it. So as you write out the initial draft of it, do whatever works. But I think that as you read back through, you'll be able to tell when a name is appropriate and when the pronoun is a better choice. Um, typically, if I have like a block of text, I'll use the name once, right? So like I have a chunk of conversation, I'll use the name once. And then if I need to like do another tag, I'll use a pronoun. So it's just kind of a push pull that I think you figure out as you revise. Um, Oh, this is a good question. How do you write remembered dialogue differently than true dialogue? Example, if your character is remembering a conversation that they had in the past, how do you show that memory is in, that that memory is imperfect and how the char and how the character impacts the way that dialogue is remembered? Honestly, with this question, it's going to depend on your story. Dialogue, write it like a reader, right? Like as you're constructing your dialogue, think of it, think of how you would think of things as a reader. So if a book is written completely in past tense, like the dialogue can be as clear cut as you want it to be, right? Um, but with your question, one of the easiest ways to acknowledge that something might be might be misremembered is to just say so on the page, have the character say aloud, like, I might not be remembering this correctly. Um, or I think he said, or like, so using things like think, seem, those kinds of words are really helpful in establishing a little bit of doubt about like the true veracity of like, true veracity is such a redundant statement. But anyway, having those kinds of words is something that will give your care, give your reader very quickly and succinctly the idea that like maybe what's being remembered here isn't exactly accurate and you don't have to do too much to to get that across. Okay, let's see. Uh plot progression and plot development are basically the same thing. Sorry if I in, so if I said them interchangeably it's it's the same thing. So like progressing the plot is moving it forward and so is developing it. Like I typically, I guess I would also use the word, the phrase plot development when I'm like building a plot before I start writing. So when I'm like outlining and that that portion of my creative process, I would also call plot development, but like I, I use them interchangeably. Um, how do you make sure that conversations don't get boring and keep readers entertained? Now this is a tricky one, right? So like as you can tell from the stuff I read, I like infusing a lot of humor into my dialogue because I think that like, not only does it help make characters exciting and relatable and people you actually wanna talk to or hang out with, having that humor also keeps the dialogue entertaining. However, if you find that your dialogue is getting boring, you might be writing stuff that doesn't need to be in dialogue, right? So like, sometimes there are things written in dialogue that would be easier, that would be more easily covered in just exposition. Or you're having, people are talking, but like they don't really need to be. So you have to figure out, and this all, again, all of this needs to happen in revision. As you guys are writing your, like don't try to figure these things out before you write your first draft or as you're writing a first draft, like give yourself the space to just write things as they come. And then when you go back into revise, I think you'll be able to tell what conversations are too long, what conversations can be cut shorter, what conversations are just there because they're funny. Like there are, I have seen books where there's a lot of dialogue 
but the dialogue is kind of unnecessary. Like it's not really progressing the plot. It's not telling us anything new about the character. It's really just the author trying to show everybody that they're funny. And that you want to watch out for that. So also make sure you have um, people reading things for you, because I think that there's something very important about having eyes on your work that are not your own, because we're very limited in how we interpret our own work. So make sure you're having other people look through things and read them so they can actually help you see whether or not the dialogue is necessary where you have it. Um, if you write pure dialogue in one part of the book, do you do it for the whole book? No, not at all. Um, and how do you switch between that POV to pure dialogue? So this for me is like a chapter by chapter thing. Like some chapters I will write, if I start in pure dialogue in a chapter, that chapter will only have pure dialogue. If I start with like regular dialogue in a chapter, chances are that dialogue will, that chapter will only have regular dialogue. But again, a lot of this is just intuition, right? Like I think that like a lot of the times as creative writers, we can get too bogged down in some of the mechanics too soon. Um, so when it comes to when I decide to write in pure dialogue, like I said, for me, if there are more than four people talking nine times out of 10, I'm going to go with the pure dialogue. Um, if there are just two or three, I can go with like three max. I will write typically write regular dialogue because I don't really need the pure dialogue. So for more than that, I'm going to write the pure dialogue and also depending on the subject matter, but we'll stick to the numbers here just to make it simple. If I'm writing up to three characters speaking, I'll use regular dialogue. If I am doing, um, if I'm writing four or more characters speaking, I'll do pure dialogue. And you absolutely, guys, listen, like a lot of these questions are, I love these questions, but can you combine regular dialogue and pure dialogue in the same story or scene? Do you think pure dialogue style is mainly for contemporary novels or can it work in history, in fantasy or historical settings too? Um, is there a particular way to fit pure dialogue into a particular genre? I want to set all of you free to do whatever you want. It's your story. You get to decide how you want to use dialogue on the page. Just because you've never seen it done before doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done or that it can't be done. So if you are a writer of fantasy or science fiction and you have a scene with six people in it and you think that pure dialogue is something that could work for that scene, give it a try, right? Like I do think that when it comes to how you write your dialogue in books, you will have to massage and like add nuance and all of that. But if I'm writing a book about, you know, two kids who get lost in a fantasy world and there are six people talking in the scene, I figure I feel like I can figure out a way to structure that scene so that I can write it in pure dialogue. So it's less about what you can and can't do and more about figuring out how to do what you want to. Well, let's see what else we got in here. How do you introduce pure dialogue so it doesn't feel like an abrupt transition? I love this question. So this is where I'm saying that you guys should take the time to just kind of look online and read screenplays. Because typically in a screenplay, you have a scene introduced, like there's this exposition chunk where you're introducing a story or a scene and then you jump into the dialogue. It's literally the same thing if you wanna do it in prose. Um, in Dear, let's see. In Dear Justice, there's actually a scene that I wrote genuinely in screenplay format, largely because, number one, I thought it'd be fun. So, okay, the end, a short film. So we have like who the thing is starring, right? The setting is described. And then here, after exiting, is where the exposition starts. So the exposition lasts for like a little bit and then you have where the dialogue begins. So you have people talking. Then we go into more exposition here on this side, right? So then you have like another paragraph of exposition. It works the same way, even if I'm not writing it in pure dialogue, even if I'm not writing it in screenplay format. So this is an example here. You have the introduction here on this page, and then we break into the pure dialogue where you have people talking, right? So think of it as if you want to use pure dialogue, set your scene, let the conversation happen. And I usually close just on the conversation. Like I don't I don't typically wrap up the conversation. Like the the dialogue will be the bulk of the chapter and it will end 
with like a bang that somebody is saying, right? So like you end with like a click hanger, a click hanger, a cliffhanger. Um, but with that click, that cliffhanger is actually coming from something somebody said. So it's like a mic drop. So we won't call it a cliffhanger. We'll call it ending, if you're doing pure dialogue, ending that chapter with a mic drop. Let's see. Ooh, this is a really good question. I love this question too. Do you have any tips for writing characters who are interrupting and talking over each other? I want to teach you guys very quickly about this thing called an M dash, right? So if you are writing dialogue and somebody is interrupting, let me see if I can find an example in something here. Um, the, uh, the interruption is literally just this little dash that goes inside the parentheses. So in order to get that little dash, you hit your dash button twice. So like on your keyboard, you should have like, if you go, if you're looking at the keyboard on the right hand side, that top row where all the numbers are, there's a delete key, there's like the plus equal key, and then there's like the underscore and dash key. If you hit the dash key twice, and then you type something and hit a space, it puts an M dash into the thing. So into your text. So with dialogue interruption, you create an M dash and you close the parentheses. And what that does, it gives the effect of, of somebody being interrupted. Um, I'm trying to find, let's see if I can find an example here. Here we go. This is a really great section and I'm going to read it aloud and I will tell you where the M dashes are. You think a kid who feels as bad about himself as Jax does can muster up the motivation to get good grades? And God, forget, God forbid me or him get sick, M dash is here. He or I, Rico. So her mother interrupted her to correct her. And in order to do that, you can see here, maybe if I can get it. Yeah, there we go. Um, there's the M dash in this line. So utilize it. And there are, they go all throughout the page because they're having an argument. So if you look down this page, you can see that there are M dashes at the end of a lot of these paragraphs. There's one there, there's one there, there's one in the next, at the end of the next paragraph. So these are two people arguing with each other and those cutoffs where somebody is interrupting are represented by that little bitty piece of punctuation. That's actually one of my very favorites. Um, ooh, how do online conversations differ from in-person dialogue in a, no in a novel? So listen, this is the thing, right? The stuff that you're seeing, the online conversations, it's really the same thing. You can format it differently. Like I like writing stories where there are text messages and I will use the page to show like this person is speaking on this side. So it shows up like it does on a phone. So one person is like right oriented and the other person's messages are left oriented. And so then you know like who's talking based on that. So there's just so many ways that you can utilize the page itself especially when it comes to writing conversations that are taking place online. So think about how you would see it take place online and you would write it the same way. The one thing that I think is different between conversations that are taking place online and conversations that are taking place in character, <coughs> excuse me, are maybe some of the internal things, right? Because I think people tend to be a bit more bold with what they're saying when they're talking to other people online. Um, so perhaps if you're having a conversation in person, big people are talking, but you you learn more about what they're really feeling or what the, the perspective character is really feeling from the stuff that they're not saying aloud, right? So there's stuff in the parentheses and then there's stuff outside of the parentheses, kind of the processing of what the other person is saying, et cetera. Um, and then with like stuff happening online, I think there's a little bit less of that trepidation about really saying what you feel. So I, but on the page, they don't really have to appear that differently. I think all you have to do is really say, you know, we had a conversation online or like I said X, Y, Z to him in the chat and then he was and then he can respond or, you know, like they're just ways of letting people, letting your reader know where the conversation is happening. Um, oh, this is good. When you have a number of characters in conversation with a different background, how do you differentiate their voices in dialogue? If they have similar education, what are the ways to make their rhythms distinct? This, you're just going to have to spend more time with your characters and get to know them. I have a character template that I use to, I fill it out when I need to know more. I usually fill it out for every main character. And then when I need to know more about a secondary character, I'll fill it out for that character too. And I mean, this is like two solid pages of 
single spaced questions. And as I fill it out, the character becomes more real to me. Knowing what, knowing a character's background, like what their relationship with their parents is like, where they grew up, these are the things that inform a character's voice, right? So if I have a character who is, I, I'll give you a, an example of two very similar characters, Rico from Jackpot and Jupiter from Odd One Out. The things that make these two characters different. Rico is raised by a single mother. She lives in the suburbs and she is straight. Jupiter is queer, has two fathers, and lives in the city. So they sound very different. Their level of competence is different. The way that they speak is different. The terms that they use, they're regional terms. So like where a person is from, I'm Southern. You can't hear it right now because I have it turned off. But like, if I really wanted to, I could really talk like a Southern girl, right? So the words that a character uses will depend on the region that they're from. It'll depend on who they are. So really the answer to this question is get to know your characters better. That way it'll be easier to hear them speaking and then to translate that to the page. Um, is it okay to use improper grammar such as run on sentences during dialogue? I always feel like I see perfectly crafted sentences, but that's not how people talk. Girl, Sarah, listen, I do not fool around with no proper grammar. I hate y'all, I hate proper grammar so much, largely because exactly what you just said if it's written perfectly sometimes it doesn't really sound realistic there is a fine line between writing characters as they sound and like as they talk and just like writing in terrible vernacular like in huck finn when jim is saying things like shit did though you don't want to write like that but I do think that there is something to be said for allowing characters, writing the characters speaking as they actually speak. Sometimes that involves dropping a G and an ING word like he was running or like there are some examples in pretty much all of my books where a character, a black character is speaking. And instead of, you know, I saw him running, I saw him running down the street. It'll say like he was running down the road. And like are the in the run in will end with an in with a with an apostrophe. These actually are just style choices, though, right? Like you don't have to write that way. Um, just think you just have to figure out what works for you and let that be what you do. Okay, I'll do one more question. Um, oh, this is a good one and a good one to end on. Hey, Nick, how do you balance using slang without dating your dialogue, especially since slang often goes out of fashion within a few years? I typically don't use, you You would be surprised. I don't use a ton of like slang that changes. And if you are listening to other people speak, if you're keeping your thumb kind of on the pulse of pop culture, you'll know what you should and shouldn't use in a book. However, the flip side of this is I don't believe there's such a thing as dating a book, right? Like if a book is written in 2020 and it's full of 2020 slang, there's no reason that that shouldn't be there, right? Like books written in 2015 are representative of things that are happening in 2015, unless it's historical fiction. But like historical fiction is a great example, right? There's a book that came out this year called The Black Kids. I love it, love it, love it, love it. And a lot of the words in there come from 1992 because that's when that book was set. Angie Thomas's next book, Concrete Rose, it comes out in, at the end of January or actually it might be the middle of January. But anyway, in that book, it's a book set in like 1999. So there's a lot of 1999 slang in there and there's nothing wrong with that. So if you're writing a book set in 2020, it's fine for it to have 2020 slang. If you want to avoid that though, just tweak your slang. You can make up new slang or decide on words. Like there are slang terms that like never go out of style. Like the word cool. Nobody's ever gonna not use the word cool, I don't think. Especially in the sense of like, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about, right? So like, we use words like lit now, and even lit I hear is going out of style, but before lit it was turnt, before turnt it was crunk, right? I don't use any of those in my books because I know that they're going to continue to change. So instead I'll say like live, because live is one that's kind of, yo, it was live. Like that's a little different than like, yo, it was lit. So you'll figure out exactly what you need to do. Closing remarks here, figure out what's gonna work for you and don't try to get it right on the first try. 
Write things the way that you are hearing them initially, and then you can go back in and massage. Thank you all for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> and I hope you all have an excellent, excellent dialogue-filled day.